So if you're watching this video, I'm guessing you wanna to learn to airbrush. Well, today I'm gonna to show you why it's one of my top three tools anytime I'm creating one of my leather projects. So let's hit the intro and jump in. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Reitz. This is Weaver Leather Supply. You might know me from my YouTube channel, The Leatherverse. I'm gonna start by asking you for your help with something. This is gonna be an ongoing segment for the foreseeable future. And if we're gonna do that, I need to come up with a name for it. Chuck's got the leather element. I started to call this the Weaver's. My channel is the Leatherverse, the Weaver's, but that makes it sound tiny, like, you, you know. know. It's the Tinyverse. We tackle all the tiny little leather projects. That doesn't really work for me. So you tell me, what should we call this segment where I help you with the tooling, some tips and tricks, and airbrushing? Leave it in the comment section below. But that's not why you're here. You're here because you want to be a master airbrush artist. I don't think that's a thing. But maybe you just want to do some shading on a wallet or a belt or a journal cover or something like that. Either way, I got you covered. So let's start by talking about what an airbrush is. Well, an airbrush has a hose that connects to the bottom. It pushes air out through the airbrush. And as it does, it draws paint or dye or whatever you have in the bowl out through the end of it and it sprays it onto your project. You're able to control the, the width of the spray and the amount of spray by the distance from the canvas and how much you pull the trigger back. There's a couple of different types of airbrushes. The two most common are gonna be the single action and the double action. A single action simply means you have air coming in. When you push the trigger down, you get both paint and air. It works a lot like a, like a rattle can, like a spray can. So push it down, you get paint and air. The way you can control it is you can back off of the canvas. Some of them have limiter switches on them that will uh, you know, limit how much paint comes out. But really, it's a more cumbersome way of doing the same thing that you can accomplish with a dual action. The way a dual action works is you push down on the trigger and you get air. You pull back on the trigger, you get paint. The more you pull back on it, the more paint you get. It's kind of like the accelerator on a car. So real quick, let's talk about what you can use an airbrush for. Well, most of you are gonna use it for applying dye to projects, maybe creating vignettes and shading around the edges so that you get that nice fade. Most of that's gonna be done with dye, and we're gonna talk about that quite a bit today. But in addition to that, you can also use an airbrush for painting, just like you've seen in some of my artwork, for shading, um, creating depth, creating an aged weather look. There's a lot of things that you can do with an airbrush, but today we're gonna talk about applying dye and how to put it on evenly, and create that, that nice vignette with it. All right, real quick, before we go any further, I've gotta go serious on you just for a quick second. And if you don't take anything else away from this video, this is what I need you to hear. Running dye through your airbrush is dangerous. If you don't have the right ventilation and the right respirator, you can get yourself into a very serious medical situation. And I'm talking like lung transplant bad. Here's why. Anytime you take a liquid and you run it through your airbrush, what happens is when it comes out the end of it, you're atomizing that liquid. And if you're breathing those harmful and caustic chemicals that are in dye and sealer and the other things that we, we use on our leather projects, that's a great way to get into a really bad medical situation. So there's two things you've got to do anytime you use dye in your airbrush. Number one, my rule is I absolutely under no circumstances ever run dye through my airbrush indoors. It's just too easy for it to leave through the cracks in the doors, to, to saturate the air, to get to a harmful level indoors, to harm my pets or something like that. So absolutely under no circumstances do I ever run dye through my airbrush indoors. Number two, you have to wear a correctly rated respirator for dye. Now I'm not an expert on this, so I'm gonna refer to the 3M website. 3M makes a lot, well, they make everything it seems like, but one of the things that they make are the really good quality respirators and filters. And here's what they have to say about it. The P, as in Peter, series filters are filters intended for the removal of any particle, including oil-based liquid aerosols. They may be used for any solid or liquid particulate airborne hazard. So that's straight from 3M. You need the P series respirators. Outside always, lots of ventilation, respirator, P-series filter. If you do that, you're good. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, now we can talk about some of the fun stuff. The first thing that I want to address is a question that never really occurred to me until I had a student ask it, and that is, what orientation should you airbrush in? Should it be vertical? Should you lay it flat? Um, what's the best uh, way to airbrush? And the simple answer is vertical 
always. Um, if you're holding it this way, you can see this cup right here, it tips forward. Whereas if you're holding it like that, then it's, it's more or less upright. If you're like this, it's very easy for it to spill or slosh out onto your project. It's an unnatural position for you to stand when you're looking at your project and trying to get the right grip, the right eye line. It's just very unnatural. Always, 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 you want that, that project to be upright and spraying in a vertical position. Now, one of the challenges that you might run into with that is how do you hold it in an upright position? Because if you put a clip on it, it's pretty easy for that clip to create overspray marks. So it block, it's kind of like a shield. It blocks out the area where the clip's at and then your overspray can land here, which creates a two-toned effect. It's really not what you want. The easy way to do it is just take some masking tape, loop it so the sticky side's out, and then stick it to, to your surface. Maybe it's a, you know, a foam board or something like that, but you can stick it to the surface, it'll hold, and then you can airbrush and it's not a problem. Now let's talk about how much dye or paint you should put in this. You're gonna be amazed at how far a little bit will go in an airbrush. So my suggestion to you is to always use the tray in the bottom, and I know it's a little hard to see, but there's a little tray in the bottom of the bowl. My rule is I fill that up. And if I do that, then number one, I'm not wasting very much. And number two, I'm not at very much risk of it sloshing out onto my project. So I always just use the little, the little tray in the bottom of the bowl as a good guide of how much I should put in there. Really, you're not gonna use much more than that. And if you do, it's pretty easy to refill it. So use the tray. So here's the big tip that I'm gonna give you, whether you're brand new to airbrushing or maybe you've picked up this bad habit over years of doing it and just not realizing what the proper way to do it is, it's your trigger work. And it's very, very important. It is the foundation of everything. Now, this is like my fifth time trying to explain this to the camera verbally. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump over to some B-roll and just show you what I'm talking about. So first, I'm gonna show you the wrong way to do it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push down on the air, I'm gonna pull the paint back, and then I'm just gonna go back and forth with the airbrush. And what you're gonna see is it creates barbells. This is what you don't want to do. The correct way to do it would be air on, and then my movement starts and then the paint comes on. I continue moving, the paint goes off and then my movement stops. So it's air on, movement, paint, paint off, movement. So practice working that trigger back and forth, getting your control so that you can turn it on, turn it off when you want to. Avoid at all costs the temptation to turn the air on, the paint on, and then just go back and forth. That's a great way to ruin your touch, create a bad habit, and ruin your project. So when Weaver asked me to do some videos on airbrushing, they also asked me to check out their airbrush kit that they sell through their company. And when, when we had that conversation with them, one of the things I said is, okay, I can do that. I'm happy to take a look at it, but I need permission from you to be completely honest about it and 100% transparent, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they said that they would expect nothing less. They gave me carte blanche to say whatever I felt was accurate and needed to say about the airbrush kit. The good news is there's no bad and there's no ugly. There's only varying degrees of good. So let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at it. So this is the kit, comes with a nice little handle. It's got a strap that goes with it. Nice little compact package. Uh, on the inside is your compressor, your hoses, your plug, and your airbrush. So nice little kit, very easily transported somewhere if you were wanting to take it over to you know the, the guild meeting and show it to them or something like that. Nice little handy kit, really like that aspect of it. So up until this point during the video, I've been holding up this airbrush. See if I can get it there for you to see. Um, this is the Weaver airbrush. It is a dual action. It is a gravity feed. Gravity feed means that the bowl is on top and as the air goes through, not only is it is the air sucking the paint through, but also gravity's working with you and it's pushing it out the end. So it's a double action, gravity fed, and it has a limiter switch on the back of it. Think of like this like a governor on the car. So if I crank this all the way down, I can't pull the trigger back at all. If I open it all the way up, I can pull the trigger all the way back. So this is good if maybe you have it, for somebody who has arthritis and they might not have a good amount of control in their hand, a lot of dexterity for working that trigger back and they're afraid of throwing too much paint, or, or maybe somebody who's new who's still developing that control, this is a good way to really lock it down so that you can only put so much paint on the canvas at one time. And you'll hear me refer to canvas Canvas is anything you're putting paint or medium or dye or anything like that on. So while we work in leather, it's still a canvas. 
And this airbrush is a great mid-level airbrush. It will do everything that the average leather worker needs. In fact, I can use an airbrush just like this to create dreams of dragon fire. I can do this kind of work with it where I'm getting pretty fine. So this is a great mid-level airbrush that's gonna do everything that you ever need it to do. It comes with a hose. Hose is pretty standard, pretty average length. It's uh, it's not the plastic kind. It's actually got a weave on the outside, so it's a good airbrush hose. So before we go too much further, if these are the kind of videos and the kind of content that you like seeing, make sure you click that thumbs up button. That tells Weaver and YouTube that we're on the right track, that we're doing the kind of videos that you want to see. So now let's talk about the air compressor. There's a lot of positives and there's one, I don't wanna call it a negative, it's almost like it's less ideal, not really a negative but we're gonna talk about it. So the positives, super compact, super, super quiet. This thing hums and that's about it. Easy to transport, seems to be fairly reliable. I haven't run into any issues at all with it. The one downside to it is if I'm running my airbrush, it's gonna be at 25 to 35 PSI. It's pretty much standard. That refers to how hard the air is pushing. This, the maximum that I can get it to push is in the 15 to 18 PSI range. And at that pressure, Really all you're able to push is liquid that's the consistency of water. If you're running dye, you're gonna have to add dye reducer to it. I don't think you're gonna be able to run any kind of clear coats or anything like that through it. Um, you could probably dilute those and it would be fine, but I've never tried that. I don't have any experience with that. So if you're wanting to dye and shade and that kind of thing with this compressor, I think you're gonna be fine. You're just gonna have to work slow. You're gonna have to control your distance from the canvas and it's gonna work fine. You're just gonna have to work slow. That being said, I think this is a great starting point if you're trying to get into airbrushing. It's gonna do everything you need it to do at that entry level. So shading, vignetting, applying dye, that kind of thing, right? And what I mean by starter kit is that it's gonna do what you need it to do until you outgrow it. Some of you may not ever want to outgrow it. This will do everything you need it to do. But if you ever get to the point where you're wanting to do more complicated stuff like this, you're gonna to wanna to increase that PSI. And to do that, you, you've simply outgrown the tool, you didn't invest a lot of money, and now you're ready for the next step. But in the meantime, this is a good solution. It's gonna do everything you need it to do. So that's it for this video. We're gonna be doing a lot more videos just like this on airbrushing. If you wanna see that kind of stuff, make sure you click the thumbs up button. And in the meantime, go make something amazing.